Hello, hello, and welcome to the Soapbox Podcast, hosted by Ian Hirschfeld and Logan Dwight. Join us today at Tactile Design up in Seattle, Washington, where we meet with Rich and Jordan to talk product development, intuitive interfaces, and the future of VR hardware. So what are you waiting for? Come hang out with us. To soap dish, where we talk about <laughs> soap and we dish on all the goods. Yeah. Today we're going to be talking about fat gossip here at Tactile. We're actually going to talk about product design, which is way more interesting than fat gossip. We have Rich and Jordan here from Tactile Design. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Oh yeah, no problem. Hey. Happy to be here. Which it sounds weird to say because I'm here all the time because this is where we work. Yeah, so happy to happy have to, you. Happy to still be here. Happy to have you in our... <laughs> that sounds morbid, happy to still be Yeah, you're right. Happy to still be employed by this place. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, here, we'll do. Happy to have you guys. Thank you. Yeah, visiting Tactic today. Thank you for tonight. Yeah, why don't you guys want to start? Tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing. Uh, I am the design director at Tactile. Uh, Jordan is our is our lead UX designer. I mostly focus on industrial design, but at Tactile it's more like you know we want to we want to think about the product as the industrial and the UI UX as one offering, um, because the experience usually you know how nice the object is as a physical object. Um, if if the the user experience of what's happening on screen or how you interact with the with the product. Is um, is a miss? Then the ID doesn't really matter. So offering the whole thing is kind of the what we try to what we try to do here. Yeah. That's 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 the ultimate. That's it. That's the ultimate. Yeah. yeah. One stop shop. One stop shop. Packaged good. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's usually not this. It feels dark in here, but it's a it is a common dreary winter Seattle. I mean, day. it was it was so nice today and yesterday. Yeah. Right. But don't tell anybody that because more people will move here. Yeah. <laughs> So it was really, really crappy. Disgusting. It's too late. It's <laughs> yeah. honestly too late. It's, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. It's not nice. It's not nice. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about about kind of how product design is moving forward into like the 21st century. So like I think that one of the things that I see a lot around your office and the things that you guys work a lot on is a lot of these different. Uh, hardware to software interface tools. Like you said, you're doing this whole UX thing, but you're also industrial design, and so you're all about kind of product from from one end all the way to the other, both like the oh, what was the metaphor for that? An- analog to digital or something like that. Sure. Um, but I find that like a lot of times, like what we're sitting around our office, we're always talking about how we see all companies like trying to come up with new interfaces for various platforms, like whether it's things like VR or you have people trying to come up with new ways to interface with mobile technology or, um, and you just see a lot of really, frankly, like unintuitive garbage. Uh, and I'm curious as people who are like inside the process, like where do you think that those things go wrong? And like, like what kind of like, how do you get to a place where, um, you know, you can have a whole team of people working on something for a long time and you have a project out that's completely unintuitive, non ergonomic yeah. You see hardware come out all the time that makes no sense. Burkles that feel like somebody's weird, hackneyed idea that just got too much budget. I could take a crack at that for a yeah. little bit. Sure. Uh, I think sometimes it's like um, what we try to do with, with any client relationship is, is you want to have a kind of a clean kickoff, meaning that like the engineering team, the marketing team, the design team, you're at some point your visions have to align. And I think you see products, um, you know, the way everyone believes in, in, in doing this, this one thing, right? And I think you see products sometimes that, that fall a little short at the end because, you know, the engineering team peeled off or the marketing team or that person left the company or the design team's not involved at the end or whatever. And then a little bit of maybe what was a really good idea at the beginning can get kind of lost along the way. It's a lot like, I think design can be like the telephone game when you're a kid, you know? Mm-hmm. Where you play where it's like you say one thing and, and then 20 people later, it's like a completely different thing. Um, okay. So I think, I think sometimes, you know, products, I don't think people realize, but um, normal, normal folks yeah. realize <laughs> that the, uh, you know, the products take a couple of years to come out, right? 
And I think if you fast track a product, it can take like a year and a half, and that's still a long time. Um, and stuff gets lost along the way, but a lot of the products we work on are, you know, like these tools for professionals or the medical products or, um, you know, you're working on a new oscilloscope or some, or some really serious tool that has to go under a, a lot of testing before it, it makes its way into the wild. Um, a lot of stuff can get lost, and I think if, if, uh, if you don't have the same team on it pushing it forward that kind of had the, instilled the, the right soul in the beginning, then yeah, some of the, the moments can be missed and it can start to lose what, it, what made it special, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think that kind of goes yeah. into more of like process stuff, but I think yeah. like what you were talking about before too, things that are like new with VR, are trying to be interesting and innovative and all this stuff, there's also just stuff that just kind of works and being new and interesting isn't always the most effective way to make anything yeah. or no, make totally. anything that makes sense. So. Yeah. Some stuff is like tried and true, and like the best working thing in like everyone's car is still like the volume knob right. that you can just reach over and grab. But then you see like all this crazy, flashy crap that's happening in the center. It's like I just need to turn off yeah. like the volume, yeah. and how do I do anything else? No idea. Yeah, know you know, like every, one thing. like everything touch screen in the car makes yeah. almost no sense. Yeah, because you, the car is when you want to never be looking at what's in here. You want to always be looking at what's out there, and physical. Things, physical controls that you can like that tactile. Always plug our name. Tacti <laughs> the, the, the tactility of, of of a thing is like so critical, and you know that at some point it became just this trend of like I'm going to slap an iPad. I mean, even with cars, it looks like an iPad's in the dashboard. Yes. Yeah. Like, I don't know how touch became like a great idea. I think you can do it like with huge some touch stuff. targets. Some stuff. Some stuff's fine, right? I'm but curious. volume with touch is not cool. Yeah. <laughs> when you're in the car. I'm wondering if. Because yeah. you're, you're kind of you just you brought up the point of like you know a fast product might take a fast physical product might take a year and a half. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if that like bringing an iPad into the car as the dashboard is a way to compensate for like I can't spend a year and a half to figure out all the UI right now. So let's make a digital dashboard Probably. that we can update on the fly if we have mm -hmm. um, connection to Wi-Fi, right? Because um, the turnaround time for UX UI is generally faster because you can iterate, because you can, oh, mm -hmm. right? sure, totally. Sure, um, and that's where Apple's getting into the car and Google and yeah. all this kind of stuff, and you can, yeah, updating it seems like, yeah. It, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point, for sure. Uh, some controls seem a little, I don't know, volume is a really easy one to just- I'm not saying out. they're but, better. Right, 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 <laughs> but some are like, you know, should, I, I think there's the, I think the smart way to do it, and what some cars do is, is um, separate the things that should be updatable in, in, in a UI experience to things that should be physical and remain physical. Mm. Um, and I think having that separation, uh, knowing that like, yeah, like updating the, you know, how you see a lot of the information, even on the dashboard, um, completely updatable on the fly is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but where you, like your, your blinkers probably shouldn't touch controls, yeah. things like that. We have a lot of clients too your that try wipers. to yeah. figure out how to do the same amount of flexibility with hardware mm -hmm. as well, where yeah. they're like, yeah. It, it can even come down to like a process. Like if you want to laser cut in like a title of a button or you know a word into there, you have to figure that out kind of ahead of time. But people just trying to figure out like that's why like pad prints or one reason that they're really popular aside from just like being cheap is like you can kind of figure out what that thing says at the last minute or know that you have like mm -hmm. eight physical buttons somewhere, yeah. but not really sure what those things are until like the very end. So yeah, I think. People are like clients and people who make products just wanting flexibility like right up into the end because no one really knows like right, right. is a thing. But that's when you get in a car or anything that's like really thought out. It's pretty obvious that everything's in the they committed to you know research or figuring it out and everything's just kind of in the exact yeah. right place, which is always the win. So we've talked about cars so much. We've never designed a car. But it would be yeah. so good. Yeah, it'd be so good if we did because it's so easy. <laughs> it's the easy. <laughs> So I'm sure it's so easy and takes like no time. We don't want to do that inside, right? We'll just do the inside. Yeah. <laughs> no, the inside's where I would be yeah. actually It'd be most, most fun. Just about, the yeah. volume ones. Just that. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is like I remember looking at um, it was like the Ford Fusion had just come out and they had this um, uh, another design, great design firm, uh, you know, was doing like the, it was one of the first hybrids that was really kind of popular and it had like the plant growing kind of in the, um, mm -hmm. on the dashboard. Really pr pretty cool, and there was like the, the opposite spectrum of that was like Bentley did, like when they came out with like their car on their website, it was like they'd have a giant close up of literally like the knob that you use to, to I mean it was literally like a volume knob, but it was like mm -hmm. knurled and like made of like this beautiful stainless steel, 
it would be like this whole giant image of this tiny, tiny button, <laughs> this physical button. And it was like, yeah, forget the digital. Like they were, they were so polar opposite of that. But you know, they were, you, you know, they were both super interesting in their own ways. But it was, it, I, think, I think we talked about it at the time of like, you know, can you have these hybrid experiences be very high end mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time and like be like in your face of like plants growing and stuff like that and mm -hmm. how would how would a company like Bentley or I think I think um, Lexus was doing something at the time that was very different you know and would those things kind of seem cheap and stuff and I don't know where I'm going with that but it was interesting at the time to see like where where UX in the car was kind of landing you know mm -hmm. that's cool yeah 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 actually that, that makes me so uh, I, you said something that I think is really interesting which was it's like a like a side comment in what you were talking about, which was like sometimes nobody knows what they want, like throughout this whole process or like right up to the end. Yeah. And so you have all this flexibility that needs to be built into the process. And so like you know what we do at Soap is, is primarily software, so mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. But even then, like I'm very interested in hearing about how how you kind of shepherd your those those indecisive clients, especially in the when they're building physical objects, because like even for us, right, like the kind of work that we do. We'll meet with a client, and even if we have the flexibility, because it is a digital product and we can push updates on the fly, the very first part that we do with any client meeting is we sit down and we just try to distill down their indecision. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like you you get you're sitting in a meeting with a client, and I basically I, I even tell them like you actually don't have to know what it is you want oh, to do. Yeah. You oh, can just yeah, yeah. we can just sit in a room together, and my job is for <clears throat> listening to you rant about the thing you kind of want, the idea, the vague problem you're solving, whatever. And I'm gonna take a whole bunch of notes, and then I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna distill it down into what I think is a list of solutions, and then I'm gonna provide it back to you. And then we're gonna to come to like a, a decision. It's almost like part of like our process is forcing a decision on the on the client, mm -hmm. um, and then working with them every step of the way. Whenever they have a question against that decision, being like, well, like how does this balance against our original discussion? But it's just funny because like we actually theoretically do have the flexibility to not have to do that, but we do it anyway because it does make our job easier and it ensures that the product can be quality because we can execute on one vision from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder like when you're working on like a physical product, mm -hmm. like how do you how do you account for those indecisive people? Like when you when you have somebody, a client who is not gonna nail something down and you've got to work with them on a on a timeline that's gonna be a year plus. You know, what does that look sure. like? Uh it, it's it's probably the same process where, you know, up front you're doing a lot of listening and then um, in the first meeting, uh, and this gets a little bit into like kind of the, the tools we use too, but in the first meeting you're showing some like rough ideas um, to elicit a good conversation. And I think like the first, depending on if it's a longer project, you're not assuming you're going to get a solution in the first couple of meetings. You're just kind of, you're, what you're trying to do is bring everyone along um, so that you can all land in the same place at the, maybe the same time or that everyone thinks they're landing at the same time. Maybe you landed earlier. Um, but the idea is that uh, and I think what design is really um, can be really good at is navigating everyone and kind of corralling everyone to to um, to be kind of like united in the end. And I think that gets back to like where we're talking about stuff being more successful objects and more successful products is when you have that um, where people kind of like agree and be like, all right, we're making this thing. We're all excited about it. Um, but I don't think it's different from like a, a physical project, a physical object, physical object to like something something in UX. I think. Something in, or UI, something in UI. I think you can change easier down the road. Everyone has to know on the on the product design thing that if we're going to meet this deadline, we got to lock certain things at these certain points. Mm -hmm. I think keeping everyone honest on that is a, also a super important thing. You know, where yeah, yeah. The biggest difference is the like the two bigger risks at yeah. the end because once you like commit to something with ID, it's like okay, now we're gonna you know. Hire a bunch of you know we engineers cut tools. or we cut, cut tools. tools yeah. You know, get vendors, get parts. Yeah. Like so many, By the material. network of people that it spreads out to that you have to mm -hmm. like align. Even like if you're just committing on like you know something like those headphones or like this plastic part. Like the amount of people that it takes to actually like get that to be a real part is a lot more. Right. Where with you know software, it could be like one dev who makes that whole thing like a reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. That's where like getting that consensus, you know, and everyone aligning on that vision is actually like, it's higher stakes really because, and then once it comes out, you can't change it until you come out with yeah. the next tool. You get or all the new next tools. Object. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all new tools. 
All new yeah. plat, yeah, change of material is a major, major thing. You know, yeah. That's like a new process. That's a massive, massive undertaking. So yeah, the, the ID stakes are higher. Yeah, way higher. Yeah. With changes. Yeah, yeah. so that's you why commit. you just hope you get commit. it right. Yeah. Do, you, do, do you find you guys, part of your process, you end up doing a lot of changes or or do you get like a, a, mm -hmm. a V2 on a lot of your products? Yeah, that you so, so a, lot, a lot of products will like, um, we'll go to, with some clients we go to China. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, typically it's China, but um, to the supplier to be like on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have the most impact at making subtle changes. I see. Changes at that point when you're in these like, um, uh, you know, you usually have like two or three rounds is kind of common before it's production, you know, before it's, oh. um, you know, they call them like, you know, POC units versus EV units or whatever, but uh, these evaluation units. And they usually hit like a thing where like your EV, whatever it is, is kind of a real unit. It just says like, do, not for sale on the back or something like right. that. And it's a, for evaluation for dog fooding or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think like there's, there's moments on the floor where if you're not on the floor, you, there's no way to change it. There's no way. I mean, or unless you have a lot of time. They're sending you back products. You're literally, you're like do, writing notes on them, I guess. Um, but that, there's so much lost in translation that can happen. You kind of have to be there, mm -hmm. but you can make changes. You're making changes at that point for like CMF mm -hmm. stuff. You're not making like, hey, this, this is, uh, uh, I, you know, I had second thoughts about this being plastic. I want it to be metal. That's not what you do then. Yeah. You know, you already made that decision and you committed. And that's going to be like, if you come up and be like, yeah, this whole thing, you know, we need to do this in like an overmold, or we need to use paint, or we need to use a completely different process. Is like, okay, the program's going to delay and all that kind of stuff. So, it's a stakes. Yeah. Thing. But you can make changes. Mm -hmm. You kind of got to be there, though. I think. And we've had we've yeah. had clients that we have worked with multiple, like for years on multiple products, or okay. you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. I think Clarisonic's an example of a company that we've been able to work on their products, and those have shipped, and we've learned from them, or learn what's good or bad, what not to change, and then, you know, kind of with the next one, have yeah. all that stuff in mind. So I think we're yeah. fortunate enough as a consultancy to actually have done that, which is yeah. great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. What's so, um, all right, I'm going to change the subject real quick here. Uh, so sure. Since this is a VR podcast and, yeah. uh, and you guys are a, a product design firm, Something that we talk about a lot around our office because we're always talking about thinking about VR, trying to watch how the trends are going, always trying to play with the latest devices that are coming out, is as I, I very briefly like hinted at earlier, kind of all these new interfaces that people are coming up with, whether it's like hardware interfaces, software interfaces, um, hopefully the, the melding of the two. I think the most visible one has been you know Oculus with their touch controllers, Ian's used them. They are we 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 all use them. Well, okay, yeah. so they're, they're like very impressive. So yeah. They, yeah. So the thing that I, I wondered, and uh, and before they announced the Oculus Touch controllers, I had been thinking about this already. We were talking about it around the office a lot, and it was really frustrating me that until they had kind of made that announcement, I felt like nobody was working hard enough to develop a one size fits all solution. Yeah. For because like I, I I'm th thinking about you know like VR as a medium. It's not going to be one of those things where every single application is going to be functioning the same way. So you can't, like I think that um, you can't just have an Xbox controller, or you can't just have a mouse, or some other thing like that. You have to have something that can be versatile and used in lots of different ways, whether you're playing like a VR first person you know, experience, or whether you're using some sort of desktop style application, but in VR. And so I guess my question to you guys is coming from your two disciplines. A, do you think it's even possible? And B, how would you approach a, a one-size-fits-all solution? Like, I want to, like, say I'm a consumer, I want to be able to plug in my future VR hardware and have one input device, the way that my Xbox has one input device. Well, technically two, because you have to connect. But, like, let's say hypothetically, one input device, right? I do not want to have to, like, it's frustrating right now on my, on my PC at home to switch between mouse and keyboard and my controller, depending on what game I'm playing or what I'm doing. Right, it's like oh, I'm 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 working on doing some video editing, but now I'm playing, you know, Metal Gear. I want to I want to have my controller. I, I want to be in a world where my hands never have to pick up multiple different things, and I don't have to like keep them all stored around my desk. But is that even a goal worth striving for? Like, how do you how do you attack that? Yeah, I think I think the the most or the closest thing is probably a leap to like achieving that. Where I think even. I don't know if it was this last week or a couple weeks ago where they announced that they're going to do the uh, 
or they have the uh, head mount or the VR mount mm -hmm. product for their controller, so it's all fingers and it's no objects. Like mm -hmm. getting that, and I mean, it's similar to Connector as far as like what it's doing, but of course it's getting your digits and they have like that demo where you're like pulling apart cubes and you know picking up objects with your hands. And I think the sensing of what your body's doing is gonna be something that's like completely figured out probably the soonest, but I think the biggest thing to figure out is resistance and feedback where that that's gonna be like that next step that I don't know if anyone's proven that they can even like do yet. So like when I reach my hand out and okay, okay, it's responding to my hand and I'm picking up this cube, how does my hand know that I'm like touching this cube? And that's, I think the input is maybe the, I would say easy part, like I can do it, but I can't. <laughs> uh, input is probably going to be the, the easier part to the whole thing, but feedback is probably gonna be the hardest part. To the whole it's funny. I, when I used it, I, I found myself like wanting power gloves, like Nintendo power gloves. Well, and that's essentially what Leap kind of is, yeah, right? Exactly. Is, well, it's yeah. no gloves, but yeah. it's looking, and you can yeah. see your hands in space. Right. But and you're not holding anything. You're just yeah, you're just doing this, yeah, exactly. which is essentially that. But then you want that extra thing that's like yeah. either holding your tendons in place. Yeah. It's also because it also it's exhausting. Besides the fact of like actual yeah. feedback, it is tiring to have your hands up in the air oh. all the time. The nice thing about a keyboard or mouse scenario or a control well, yeah, scenario is you're relaxed, yeah. mm -hmm. and so. You know, I, I think, like, my frustration has been, like, we have we have a, a, a Leap mount on our Oculus dev units, and uh, and we played around with a bunch of very cool stuff, very compelling, but I do run into this frustration of, like, okay, I can use my hands and stuff, but like you said, no feedback, mm -hmm. one. And then, two, it's exhausting. And so, when they announced the Oculus Touch controllers, and also, like, the Vive controller, very similar idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Still just the, the two-handed thing. Um, I got excited because my thought was, okay, I understand that there will one day be a thing that is way more advanced than this, but this is something I can hold that gives me top, name drop tactile feedback. Um, <laughs> That's how we did it. Yeah, I know. I, so I you just do that. Very funny. Yeah, um, so easy. <laughs> but, it's, but it does. It gives me it gives me that real feedback, and then also for some for solutions where I'm not necessarily waving my hands around all the time, like maybe something where you play more like an Xbox controller, I can literally just rest these in my lap and play yeah. this. You know. Yeah. And I think that that's really nice. And I'm wondering, like, where do we go from there? Like, how do we evolve from those lessons? Because I think, like, I saw like somebody had designed something that's like a device that goes in your desk and tracks your hands, and it blows air on your hands mm -hmm. to create feedback. And it's supposed mm -hmm. to pair with something like a leap motion. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, and I was like, that's a little much. Like, that seems a little crazy. Like, to think that like in the future everybody's gonna have desks with like an air blower yeah. and an Oculus goggle. And yeah, I mean, there's these. VR theme parks that look amazing, but you know where they map, yeah, exactly, where they map the entire interior and there's stuff that blows out at you and you can run around with your friends and you're in full suits and like, you know, they're, I see you and you see me and they, they've mapped the walls to the video game. And I think there's, I think that's really interesting for, for stuff like that, but at home to recreate a little bit of that, yeah, I don't think like an air spritzer or like, you know, some sort of mist, misting agent. It, it all gets kind of weird. It breaks this, I don't want to do that right. thing. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is for, for that. Maybe I think, you know, even with Oculus, like you can see out the bottom like slightly, right? There's like a little bit of, and once in a while it breaks the, once in a while it's comforting. You're like, okay, the dinosaur is coming at me and I can kind of look down and be like, ah, it's not real because mm -hmm. I can see out. Um, but I, know, I, I wonder if there's a level of, of, it, it's, it's all about the game design too. Like, are you gonna be, you're not gonna be walking around in your house, right? Because unless you design your house to look like the video game, you can hit, hit a wall. Or they have to do that clever in the UI where like stuff kind of comes in wireframey, um, you know, and be like, oh, that's my house, you know, I gotta back up. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I wonder if there's a level there of, of the, is it okay? Like, am I gonna walk around? Am I always gonna be seated? Playing video games, I think that's a connect, a connect issue with Xbox. Like, I sit down when I play video games. I think that's probably why Connect isn't as successful as it could be. We played with this really great uh, device that these guys made. It, it was called, what was the name of the school? Uh, the Taurus, I think? Taurus. Taurus. T-U-R-I-S. Taurus. 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 Um, super cool. Mm -hmm. And it's these guys that made this stool that the inside of the stool houses your PC. So it's also a PC case, which is great. It's nice streamlined. And the whole stool is hat switch. And so you sit on the stool and it tracks how you lean, and it translates that to walking. And the more you lean, because it's, it's like varying levels of sensitivity, the faster you will move, so you can go from like a slow walk to a jump to a sprint. Yeah. And um, the goal was obviously like, how can you create a seated experience 
so therefore you are not exhausted. Because I do think, con like, consumer VR is not going to be all of us running around on treadmills. It's just not going to be. I just think that no. people are... You're not going to have the holodeck floor. Yeah, I just don't think it's gonna happen. Like for most people, yeah. I think like think yeah. you're gonna have things like the void yeah. and stuff. Like I, I buy a ticket and I go. Yeah. But then you're gonna have things that are like, well, what do I do in my living room? I I don't want to have a hole in my house. It's just for VR. Um, and so, I took the, this tool they built a very cool. Uh, even their early early prototype, which was literally like a thing, was like built out of like pieces of metal bolted together and stuff. Like it was like not pretty. Um, amazing. Super, super intuitive. It immediately worked. It also pivots. So the idea is that you kind of plant your feet, and you can lean, and then you can pivot, and it's pretty smooth. Yeah. And it was amazing to think that like the problem with a lot of times with VR is, is your body knows that it's not doing the thing in in the experience. And when you're playing a traditional video game, that suspension of disbelief is easier because your brain kind of perceives that this thing behind the glass, behind the TV, is is kind of separate from you. It's like an extension of your body. It's almost like driving a car. Mm -hmm. But when you're in VR, your brain expects the body that you look down and see to be your body. And so walking when you're not walking is kind of like disorienting to make you sick, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I found that this whole thing, even though you're not actually walking, simulates enough of it because the lean is the same. Like when I'm running, I am leaning forward, or like things like that. And um, it was very, very intuitive. And I was thinking to myself, okay, well, I can see a world that maybe everybody's got you know, like that yellow stool right there, right? Something that size that you just kind of tuck behind your couch. And when you want to play Halo in VR, you've got that, right? I think that that could yeah, be really that cool. Could be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's kind of like when people did the, uh, you know, playing Gran Turismo or Forza and stuff, they had the chair. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have that equivalent something, something, some gear you bring out that's bigger yeah. to give you an advanced experience. I think we're going to see a lot of that in the next. Yeah. A few years as VR starts, there's going to be a lot of fragmentation at first yeah. as people just try all these different type of like input devices or like more hardcore experiences. I mean, the the average consumer will probably just stick with the Xbox controller or Oculus Touch or Vive, and then you're going to get people trying different chairs. You're going to get people trying the treadmill stuff, um, and we'll see. I think eventually there'll be maybe a standard that comes along with that, um, even with like the air and the fire, I'm sure eventually there'll be like little modules you can be like, cool, I want to have, I want to be able to feel air in my VR experiences. So I buy this thing that hooks onto my set or sits in front of my computer. And like, that's like the one tactile experience that you get is going to be rumble packs in your hands and then hot and cold air, right? Yeah. Eventually smell maybe. People are working. I don't know if I want to smell some of the things. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if like, like, I, yeah. like, I'm thinking about like playing like, like again, like you think about like an action game. Right, like the the obvious ones of like Call of Duty. Like I don't want to smell what a Call of Duty battlefield would smell like. That doesn't that doesn't seem like a good thing. Yeah. Well, I smell like Axe body spray. That I thought of. So some of the. Do you think? Well, this is a question for you guys. You know, you're you're closer to the VR space than we are. Um, do you think there's going to be different rules about how far you can take games in VR because of how you're kind of in it? Like I look look at a game like Alien Isolation. Right, it's kind of a frightening game to play in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. No, not in VR. It's but fun. it's a frightening play to it's a frightening game to play with just the lights off in their couch without VR. But in VR, I could see someone having a heart attack playing that game. Yeah. Like legitimate like anxiety yeah. attacks or like medical issues oh, yeah. with some of the experiences. The but do you think they'll have epilepsy warnings? Yeah, exactly. The they're gonna they're seriously, just be like, right? Literally yeah, like a, a heart attack though this time. Yeah, almost like a roller coaster. I think it'll be the same thing as anything else. I think it'll be just like with any movie. Oh, it's like, like a more of a theme park ride. But I think like it'd be more, it'd be like when, when like movies first started yeah. and video games first started. It was always like right. in the beginning, yeah. because of this new fidelity level, everyone was afraid of like, oh my god, don't stimulate me too much. So right. do you think we'll have new ratings? All new kinds of ratings. Yeah, yeah I do right. think we'll have new touch I mean, already. But I think then we'll adjust. Like yeah. I think it will not be too too long before we have developed yeah. Call of Duty and VR, Alien Isolation and VR. Like that. That. I mean, well, technically, Alien Isolation already supports VR. Um, people are also already starting to do research. I think as VR becomes more out there in the public. There's going to be more and more funding going into this type of research, the psychological stuff. Um, like admittedly for the Oculus, Facebook started right off the bat and like, we are claiming that you should not, you should be at least 13 years old to use the Oculus. Yeah. Not because they actually know like that's like the safe age net, but they don't want to yeah. risk it yet because it's still very early. Like we don't know what these effects are going to be. I mean obviously like epilepsy has been a thing, so like it's very easy to have that. Right. But like don't do in isolation if you're prone to Heart attacks, right? Like that. Yeah. That could be. That's probably something like that, Mike. Yeah, or like watching movies. Right? Like I remember, like Jaws had a huge effect on me when I was yes. a kid, and I think I saw it way too early as a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. But like, imagine being in the water with like you know Chief Brody. Yeah. 
yeah. like at the end of that, and you're just like, I would die. You yeah. know, like, you know, what are you going to go catatonic, you know? Right. So, yeah, I think it would be interesting where VR goes with, like, rating. And I don't want there to be, like, oh, you're blocking things. It would just be interesting in how they, like, things are going to change. Yeah, that's what I, I think, think it would be just like anything else, right? It's, yeah. like, it's like, my, like, my mom loves to go to the movies, and she loves action movies. She like she goes to see like all the Marvel movies, Transformers, all that stuff. Like she's really into that stuff. But the second you put her in front of an equivalently action-packed video game, she cannot handle it. It's way too much stimulus. And I think it's gonna be the same thing. There's going to be things that certain people will be able to handle easily if it's on an Xbox, and they will not be able to handle that exact same level of experience in VR. It'll be like this is gonna make me piss myself. This is terrible. Yeah. And I think what's gonna happen is then a certain demographic of people will adjust. And you will still have those experiences. It's going to be one of those things where it's like, you know, some like one person may not want Jaws in VR. One person might be like, that's their equivalent of like a media adrenaline junkie. They're like, I only want Jaws in VR. That's yeah, all exactly. I want. Yeah. You know, I I don't think it's going to necessarily change the type of media we make. Like, I don't think people will not be making Alien. And no, Jaws. I hope they make it. Okay. Yeah, I hope they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah it'll be interesting what happens when they do. I think it's, it's fascinating. And it's also interesting because like I also think about like that does feed feedback into the whole interface discussion of like then how do we empower users to actually feel like they're in the scene in something scary like that? Because I think it would be even more anxiety inducing to feel like I'm in the scene and I'm trying to move my body in a certain way because I'm terrified, I'm trying to defend myself, and I literally can't because the interface isn't letting me. You know, I feel like that would be oh, right. like a like a breakdown moment. Yeah. Right? And I think um, I was thinking about like the vibe. Right, so they're the other the other big one. Right? You, got, you got Oculus and you got the Vive coming. I mean, there's lots of players in the space, but those are the big two. And I think that the tech that they've got behind, I think, is amazing. But at the same time, the big thing that they tout is this whole like walk around the room VR thing. The Vive's got all these sensors. It looks like a bug eye. Right? right. You can like it detects where your couch is and other stuff. And I think about that, and I'm like, okay, that's going to be cool for like a certain subset of experiences. And I do I do think that eventually maybe every VR device will have that tech package into it. But I also think that we're going to learn pretty quick that for home consumer experiences, most people will not want to be walking around the living room. Because imagine playing Alien Isolation, and even if you were able to do something where it's like a wireframe of my couch comes into view to tell me, like, by the way, you're running from an alien, but your couch is right there. Yeah, great. I'm going to hit my couch. Yeah. It's going to happen. I'm going to hit my couch. I'm going to be so angry at literally everything. Sure. And so I feel like very quickly that's going to break down. But then how do we make that exciting if we're not running? But I think it's so dependent on what you're doing with this device. Because, I mean, we're talking a lot about, like, the equivalent to first-person shooters on a console. But to think of that as, like, the end-all for VR obviously isn't the case where, like, there's a lot of experiences that just make a lot of sense seated. And you would actually have no need to get up and move around. Like, if you're, like, working on even, like, a 3D model or, like, creating something in front of you, it very well could just be on this table in front of you. And then there's no you know, necess there's no reason to walk around in that experience at all. So having the sensors could be beneficial in some way where it's just detecting some close things, but I'm not like literally like running, you know, down this hall. And like even like it makes sense why the first like the Oculus game that's coming out, you know, with the shipment in March is, uh, you know, Valkyrie. Yeah, it's spaceships. You're seated in a cockpit and that game totally makes sense. And we're used to like the at least the AAA title for console games being first person, like for some reason, it's games where you're running around with a gun. Like that's like the game. Um, but it's funny, even like when iPhone came out, it was like, it made its own genre of games about just like touching, what can we do when you just touch the screen? Like, and the medium like kind of forced different constraints, which also forced intuitive games and or different innovative things. So with VR, like it might even be that first-person shooters aren't the most popular game on VR, or a certain type of game might just suddenly be the new. I found that early on right now, like some of, the, some of the titles that people have been producing, a lot of them have been almost a throwback to, and this is great for me because I actually, like as a kid, these are my favorite types of games to play, like classic adventure games, mm -hmm. like zero action, you're just puzzles or whatever. Yeah, puzzle games would be amazing, Limbo would be amazing. Oh my god, yeah, there was, um, what was, what's the name of the one that's on the gear? The puzzle game? The super awesome oh. one where you like just look and it, uh, and it the takes Land's End. Land's End. Oh my god. So Land's End is made by the people who made Monument Valley, Valley right? Yeah. You played Monument Valley? Yeah. Okay. So they did a Gear VR game. It is so good because you only control the game with your face. You don't do anything else. So you just sit, you put your Gear VR on, and you just look where you want to go. And they do this 
they, they are very excellent designers of it. And so they, they do a really great job of like, they have kind of these points of light in the distance, and you're like, okay, I want to go to that point of light, so you look for me. And then very smoothly, they move your body to that mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. And with the representation of the world, it all feels very natural, almost feels like flying, it's very compelling. Um, mm -hmm. And then you get to these different, you're kind of in this like magical, minimalist landscape, very similar to Monument Valley. And then you have these puzzles that you do, and you literally, it's almost like having mind powers. You look at like a rock, and then you can like, after, if you look at it long enough, it starts levitating, and you can use your mind to move the rock. Um, and you, you have to build structures and kind of align things, and it is so cool. And uh, I remember like, when we first got our gear VR to play around with the office, uh, Ian had it first, and, and I was away on a trip, and I came back, and he was like, oh, I downloaded a couple apps. And I was like, oh, which one should I play? And he's like, oh, let's play around with that. And I was like, okay, I'll play with it for like a minute. And I think I was in it for like a half an hour. Mm -hmm. I just completely, you lose track of time. Like, that's a, yeah, you you really, that's a good VR experience. Yeah, it's like, okay, I, I was so relaxed, I, I was yourself. so transported, I just mm -hmm. you know, took the goggles off and I, you know, raccoon face and I was like, oh man. <laughs> but it was really good. It's really good. And I, I do think that's interesting. Yeah. I think we will see that. That's why I think actually like things like Alien Isolation are compelling because it, people will still want some form of also like, people like adrenaline experience. Oh, yeah, but I yeah. don't necessarily think it's going to always be like shooters. No, like Alien you know, is like all about like things. running from something yeah, scary. It's things. still kind of a puzzle game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that could be really interesting. Like car driving games, racing games. Yeah, they got to release a steering wheel, like, I'm assuming. All yeah, exactly. that stuff. Yeah. Like, all the first stuff will probably be awesome seated things, yeah. which are which is super cool. And honestly, like, walking around in like a first person shooter is still fine if you're seated and yeah. just like pointing at stuff. And yeah, with and your like, thumbsticks on your controls would be fine. Input. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I do. I think, uh, I think that that's really interesting, though, what you guys are saying about specifically the idea that like there will be different types of compelling seated experiences, and that they're also, I had, I had never, for, for example, I had never thought about kind of some of the more interesting minor, or not minor, but more nuanced use cases for things like room detection and stuff. Like if you're sitting at a desk, right? Like if you're putting VR goggles on and you're sitting at a desk working, because I do definitely believe people have said this before, and I, and I think this is true, that the time will come sooner rather than later where there will be people who don't have monitors at their desk. You just sit down to work and you put goggles on your face, and that's what you do. Yep. And I think that then that makes more sense. Like, did you see um, Unreal? They they just did this engine update where it's yeah. like you can use the entire engine in VR. No. It is insane. Very. Cool. It's so Very cool. cool. And uh, there was there was this video that was put out like five six years ago. That I thought was really cool. It was just some advertisement somebody had made, but it was very pie in the sky. And it was this guy. He was like making a present for his wife for their anniversary, and it, he was in like a holodeck, and he had this thing where he would go on his arm. And he had a pallet, and he could throw things up. Like I want to put a building here. I want to put flowers here. And he built like a, he built like Paris for her. And then she like came to experience Paris with him. And then I don't know what the app is for. It's for like General Electric or something. And they were like, oh, we're building the future. Yeah. And then this Unreal thing is that. It's so crazy. It's like you like look down and like you've got all your Unreal tools. You can like throw models up. You can throw buildings up. You mm -hmm. can like use like certain tools to oh, change wow. the time of day. Do things like that. You can be like, I want rain. Creating a complete like, environment. And it is, is it like photo real? Is it real real? Oh, it's Unreal Engine Four. It's so it's like it's real, real. real. It's about as real real as damn it. Yeah, yeah, right. So. I saw some well, stuff. Like they that. released a video of like some. I think it was a child. Not a child. It's like a kid in the grass, and the grass was so amazing and the environment but it was a unreal that, that's like always one of the first things that yeah, like grass. it's like hair yeah. Yeah. Grass. hair grass water yeah oh yeah every time every yeah because you need some ai in there and like the the details like when bioshock came out they're like look at how good this water is <laughs> <laughs> so good yeah. Yeah. and it crashes through that's like, no that's totally true yeah. every time bioshock. that's a good yeah. game i would like to play bioshock in vr i play, play pretty much everything in vr yeah, oh, yeah. i want to play everything in vr i can't wait to do, like be on a long plane ride in vr is going to be the best. You can already do that. You can buy a Gear VR, and you can literally do that now, today. Yeah. Consumer products that are out there for that. That's the thing. Um, Truth. You should play Reach. Land's End on your next yeah. plane flight. There you go. Side note. Ooh, yeah, because you just head on. The new Galaxy phones are all going to come with Gear VRs. They just come with them now? The the next model, S7, they will all ship with Gear VRs. That is That's pretty so good. sick. Yeah. That is such a great move. I'm going to pretend that I already knew that. We'll cut that part out. But I okay. Don't. Sounds good. Hey, guys, I have something to tell you. The next Samsung phone. <laughs> <laughs> With VR. Cute no, VR. I knew that. I totally knew that. Yeah. I'm telling them. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for taking your time. No, no and problem. for having us hang out in your beautiful office. This has been super great. Um, it's pretty Rich, Jordan. Nice. Hey, no, yeah. thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. No, thanks we're having guys. them. Oh, yeah, yeah.
Thanks for coming. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Join us next time when we think of a new name for our podcast. All right.